to answer some of those questions. So welcome to today's Fruits on Friday series on strawberries. My name is Grant McCarty. I'm a local foods and small farms educator that works in Joe Davis, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties, primarily with commercial and non-commercial fruit and vegetable growers. Uh, this is the last of our Fruits on Friday series, one that we've had a very good response from and certainly fully expect to continue to do webinars on fruit topics and vegetable topics uh, this upcoming season to help you get started uh, today with, with those uh, topics. Um, you should have received the handouts and email today, uh, so you should be able to access them through the box folder. This is what we're going to do uh, when it comes to strawberries. We'll get into kind of a general overview of kind of what the actual plant is, if you've never grown it before. And we'll get into kind of the different cultivars that are available to you. What you're going to find that's very similar to a lot of the other fruits that we've talked about in this series is that you have two decisions when it comes to growing strawberries based on the type of strawberry. And based on that decision will dictate whether it is a, a experience that maybe is pleasant for you or an experience that perhaps brings some trouble along or is going to require you to do some additional actions during the growing season and, and throughout the year. And you'll see that as we go along today, kind of the one decision you have to make when it comes to the cultivars and the types of strawberries that you're going to grow. We'll get into the planting and the management of them because I speak from a place that focuses a lot on diseases, insects, and other topics. I wanna to include that as well today. So you see what some of those look like if you are going to be growing a type of strawberry that will be overwintering and potentially vulnerable to some of these diseases. Um, this is also a fruit that has a lot of wildlife issues with small wildlife as well as deer and others. So we'll include that topic area to kind of give you some of the suggestions that we have at the University of Illinois Extension when it comes to comes to that side. And finally, harvest. You know, what is something that you need to consider when it comes to doing harvest? Because this is the last of our series, I also want to spend a, a little bit of time just kind of recapping the fruits on Fridays. You know, what are some of the main kind of takeaway messages that I want to leave you with when it comes to growing the fruits in Northern Illinois? It's not going to take up a good par portion of our time today, but it is something that I, I just want to kind of bring up again, just to help you when it comes to determining what is the right fruit for you in your growing situation. When it comes to growing strawberries, of course, like the others we've mentioned in this series, there are opportunities and challenges. I think one of the great benefits with strawberries is that they tend to grow really well in most seasons. They tend to really do well when it comes to the summer weather we're experiencing and the springtime temperatures. They, they tend to do really well if you're on top of planting them and growing them and, and really managing them. I think one of the other benefits that, that you'll see today is that you know, when it comes to growing fruit trees or growing grapes, those need pruning and they need trellising. And this is a crop that realistically, you're not gonna be doing much of either of those. So it is one that, yes, there are some things that you need to do to really help them produce strawberries. But when it comes to, you know, a, a fear of, you've planted a fruit tree that's 10, 15 years old, and now you have to keep pruning it every season, this is a crop that we really don't see that way. Another thing that we'll talk about today is going to be our day neutral strawberries. And the day neutral strawberries are ones that are grown as an annual. So if you're thinking to yourself, I've got space, I just wanna put some fruit out in my area, but I don't want a commitment long-term, you can grow strawberries as an annual as this day neutral type, which we'll talk a lot about today, in fact. You might also find that these are less expensive commitment, you know, especially depending on how you grow them. You may find that the initial establishment and the cost of there is pretty low. Um, some of the going rates sometimes for 25 strawberry plants can be 16 to $17. And that could be something that, you know, once they've been bought, they've been planted, that's the main commitment that you have. Of course, you still have other things to do, but when you compare that to some of the other fruits that you might be, might be growing, they can be a little bit less expensive. These are also ones that can grow great in containers. They do great in raised beds, kind of those other designs and common structures that you might have in mind when it comes to growing strawberries. They can work and be pretty adaptable for it. 
Um, and yet again, you're talking about a smaller plant here too. So I think a lot of times your creativity for what you may currently have or, or plan to have uh, could work well and adapt well with strawberries. Of course, there's challenges. You know, with any of the fruits we've talked about, there's going to be challenges. There is a lot of small animal damage from uh, ground squirrels, from squirrels, from, from bigger rabbits and others, and of course deer can all impact strawberry plants. And they can chew them all the way to the ground. They can get to the strawberries just as you're getting ready to pick them. And you may find, depending on where you're planning to grow them, and how many you're planning to grow, that you should go ahead and accept that you're going to have to put some sort of maybe apparatus to keep the animals from getting to them. Um, that's just one of their issues you encounter. The types of strawberries we'll talk about today also have diseases and insects. So it's not as if we're really talking about a plant that is escaping both of these. Both of them both of the strawberries have diseases and insects and strawberries particularly get hit with an invasive insect called spotted wing drosophila, which I'll mention today. And that's one that is really notorious for the amount of damage it is doing. And it's doing damage that you don't see until you start harvesting the berries. They can also require an additional seasonal management, especially if you're factoring in that you plan to overwinter your strawberries and there's some tasks that you, that you really need to do here. You also need to accept that maybe you have gone through all of this effort to try to overwinter your strawberries and yet they still may not overwinter successfully. Even if you have put straw on top of them, even if you have tried to protect them from any kind of winter damage they might incur. You also have to factor in those late spring frosts and very wet springs that could lead to uh, an unpleasant experience when it comes to strawberries. It's also possible there's a lot of low yields in some seasons, uh, depending on our, our weather patterns, our late springs, our um, any heavy rains, and you know, any unpredictability that we sometimes encounter uh, can certainly lead to this. And if you're thinking that you're going to plant a lot of these and you know potentially sell them at a farmer's market stand, uh, recognize that there could be some labor here that goes into it, especially if you're thinking long term that this becomes a crop that you want to kind of operate and grow. So here's a drawing I did this past week to just get us to a little bit more structure. You know, we've got, of course, our strawberry plant and at the center of that strawberry plant is going to be the crown. Consider this crown the stem of that actual strawberry plant. And you'll see in a lot of your strawberry guides will discuss, you know, how to, you know, make sure that your crown is in good shape, how to plant the crown this first season if you decide to grow your strawberries as perennials. You'll also see some guides that will talk about renovating the strawberry patch with a focus on this crown and wanting to cut back some, but you never want to damage the strawberry crown. You'll hear a lot today about runners. And so the runner is what you see here at the side where you know, you've, you've sometimes have multiple runners coming off of the strawberry plant. And some types of strawberries, you're removing these runners every time you see them, or you may find that depending on if you're growing a June bearing strawberry, you're actually selecting four of these runners and all the rest are pruned out. Sometimes when you're selecting strawberry cultivars and different varieties, you will see that some of them will say that they're very vigorous in the amount of runners. And it's very important, depending on what type you're growing, that you need to manage these runners because they are taking away energy from the strawberry crown and potentially from those daughter plants. And the daughter is what you see down here below. So you see that from the runner, you have daughters that develop kind of extensions of that strawberry plant and yet kind of its own little thing where it will produce flowers and it will produce strawberries for you. When it comes to June bearing strawberries, we are selecting four daughters from a single plant. And you'll see additional drawings of that as we go along today. Of course, as you compare some of the drawings I did for you last week on grapes, we're talking about a structure that's a little bit more, a little easier to understand, at least what I think it is when it comes to growing strawberries. So I've mentioned a couple of words already and we'll go that may be unfamiliar to you and we'll get into more of this as we go along today. You have two main types. You have what's called day neutral and you have the June berry. 
And depending on which type you choose will determine some of the management that you're going to be doing in that season and potentially for, for years to come. But those are gonna be the two main types. We'll talk a little bit more about everbearing and some of those other unusual ones. But realistically, when we think about growing strawberries in Northern Illinois, we're looking at either day neutral or June berry. And of course, each of them is gonna have their own needs. One of the things to share as always, you know, order from a reputable nursery and typically you're ordering them as bare roots. Bare roots are less expensive. They come in without any growth whatsoever. They're dormant at this stage. Um, you might also be able to order them as plants, although sometimes we just don't really see much difference in yields if you order them as a dormant bare root or if you order them as an actual plant. One of the things that you may encounter is that if you're going to kind of local nurseries or home and garden centers, that selection may be very few when it comes to some of, of what it is that you want to grow. For instance, maybe the nursery that you're going to, they only have June bearing types of strawberries, and yet you want a day neutrals, or it could be vice versa, where you want June bearing and you want kind of day neutrals instead. But really consider your spacing, your area, that your commitment. And I think it's also important to recognize that if things don't go well this year, if you've encountered that you grew June Berry and it was just not a good experience, you can change it the next season. You can remove and kind of start over, if you will. We're talking sometimes about very minimal uh, input in most cases. So I tend to break up the day neutral and June bearing kind of based on maybe what you're after. You know, if you're just wanting to try it out, just give it a go with growing strawberries. You've never grown them before. If you also want strawberries this season, so say that you want to plant a strawberry plant in the spring of 2021 and get strawberries in the summer of 2021, day neutral is your, is your type of strawberry to grow. Now, the challenge though is that a day neutral strawberry is a long season of weekly harvest. So if you just, you know, if you're expecting that you're just going to plant it, you're going to get strawberries for two or three weeks and then be done with the season, that's not a day neutral. A day neutral is going to be an entire season worth and we'll talk more about that. If you're thinking then long term that you want to grow a strawberry plant and you want it to be in a location for maybe you know two to four years and you're going to overwinter it every single year then june bearing might be your one it has a short harvest period of two to three weeks and you would have that kind of yearly strawberry patch that you might be after to maybe fill in a place at your home um, but that would be the main distinction there with it and june bearing might be the one to consider it you can do both of them, but just recognize that there's going to be different management practices here and that each of these is designed for certain uh, certain things. And factor in the lifespan of a strawberry plant tends to be about two to four years. Once you start getting into that third year, you're going to see a decline in yields in most cases. And so in some capacity, it's probably at your best to really start over. You compare the lifespan of a strawberry plant to some of those other fruit trees or other fruits that we've talked about in this series that really don't even start get growing and yielding well for you, except into that year three and year four. So for the June bearing type of strawberry, it's the most common type that we see a lot of folks try out. You see a lot of varieties available to you, but there is this expectation that it's going to overwinter. So you have to factor in that it's going to really be designed as a perennial fruit you're going to plant it in the spring of 2021. And then from there, you are um, going to really be focusing in on root on the roots this season. So you're not going to get any strawberries this upcoming year. You're going to remove all of the flowers so that this plant can concentrate on the crown and concentrate on its root system. This is one that we commonly see planted the matted rose system. I'll show you a drawing of what that looks like. Um, you're choosing four runners that will then have four daughters off of them. And then the one factor that you have to recognize is that with these, because they're going to be grown as a perennial plant, you're removing all the flowers in the first season. And you're removing most of the runners that first season except for four. And it's going to need seasonal maintenance, which we'll talk about today. So as you hear folks talk about renovating a strawberry patch or renewing a strawberry patch, they're realistically talking about June bearing strawberries here. 
Here's a couple of recommended cultivars um, that we, we have at University of Illinois Extension along with other universities recommend. I've tried to go through and kind of give some description as far as, you know, what are some things that we kind of see, see with these. Um, you'll see things, words such as vigorous, and I would state that vigorous tends to mean it's going to produce a lot of runners for you, which may not be good. Is that something that you may need to remove? Um, there's ones such as early glow. It produces very early. So factor in this is probably going to be um, the end of June, first week of July. There might be some that we call maybe the late mid season. So this is probably going to be more realistically, maybe um, maybe mid-July, end of July is where you might see some of them. Um, most of the ones for June bearing tend to be a good size berry. They're very large fruit, they produce well for you. And you're factoring them with a June bearing type that harvest is about two to three weeks and then, then you're over for your strawberry season. And that's a lot of what we see a little bit of commercial scale in parts of Northern Illinois too, where we have it. The day neutrals then are entirely different. And this is a group of strawberries where we're actually seeing a lot more interest in. A lot of growers, uh, especially backyard production, are looking at day neutral. The benefit here is it's an annual plant. You're planting in the spring, you're harvesting in the summer, and then you're done. You're removing those plants at the end of the season. Some folks will try to overwinter it, and yet we still find it just is much better um, to treat them as an annual one. Um, especially if we are concerned about trying to overwinter the strawberry plant, and maybe it's not successful in, in that too. But the thing to keep in mind with this one is they're going to produce small berries throughout the growing season. So end of June, they're going to start producing, and they will comfortably keep producing as long as the temperatures are remaining above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So you should fully expect that you may get strawberries in October. There's been some growers that still are stating that they've gotten, depending on seasons, sometimes they're getting day neutral strawberries into November uh, even. These are also ones that work great in containers. They can be spaced very tightly, three inches apart, much different than some of our other spacing with it. Um, we're typically going to grow them as an annual crop, but you may be able to overwinter them. Just know that it may not, may not work well, well for you. Um, but these work best for containers, for raised beds. Yet again, we're thinking this is an annual crop with it. And we'll talk about the different management styles as we go along today with the day neutral compared to those June berry. So some recommended cultivars, I'll be on. That's one that comes highly recommended from a lot of different growers, different universities. It yields great, there's large berries. One of the drawbacks though is that it needs consistent watering, about one and a half inches of water every single week during the growing season. Seascape is also recommended, good flavor, a good top performer, EV2, uh, Poratola, as well as San Andreas is also one. Um, all of them tend to be pretty good producers um, for you. And the ones, the recommended cultivars for day neutral, as well as June bearing, are ones that you can easily find uh, at reputable nurseries, and probably you'll also find at home and garden centers too this spring. There's other strawberries out there. In fact, some of the strawberry guides that you see will list everbearing. Um, the issue with everbearing is that, well, it's, it's a great kind of perennial plant that's going to produce twice a season, usually June and late August. One of the main drawbacks is there's just not a lot of cultivars for it. So you may just find one or two cultivars available to you. Another thing is that they tend to be a little inconsistent in their productivity, and you're going to see some issues there when it comes to it. And frankly, a lot of the kind of focus on strawberries has really divided into day neutral or the June bearing types. So that's kind of why we're talking about both of those today is that the ever bearing, while it tends to yield twice for you in that season, um, it's a little inconsistent in its productivity. And that's why we really don't endorse that kind of ever bearing type. You will see pineapple strawberries. In fact, if you know Bruce Black, one of our 
uh, horticulture educators in Carol Lee Whiteside. He has grown these pineapple strawberries, which you see here in this photo. I think they call them pines, pine strawberries, if you will. Uh, they are ever bearing type, in fact, uh, but they have that pineapple like flavor and aroma and, and just kind of look a little weird, uh, if you will. Um, you also will occasionally see guides that will mention a woodland or kind of a wild strawberry. These are in fact day neutral, but they have very low yield. You only get maybe two to three berries um, off of a single plant uh, throughout that, that growing season. And of course, they tend to be more focused on their foliage than it is to kind of their productivity with it too. You may occasionally encounter disease resistant types of strawberries out there. When we compare it to apples, pears, and grapes, we, we don't see it, see it as much, but there are some. And I think this might be an important thing to consider if you're growing Juneberry. If you have a, if your plan is to grow your strawberries as perennial and as a June bearing type, look towards having some that maybe have disease resistance so that it could at least help with some of those diseases that we'll talk about today. Um, but you may not find many options and just recognize that that's okay. You know, I, I think certainly when we talk about fruit trees and grapes, we would absolutely recommend disease resistance. When it comes to strawberry varieties and cultivars, you know, see what you can find, but just recognize that there may not be much out there available to you. Some of the common resistance for this is powdery mildew, leaf spot, verticillium wilt, uh, examples of ones that do have some resistance for certain diseases, early glow, jewel, albion, and seascape. So you see two of these are June bearing, the early glow and jewel, and then you have some disease resistance for um, two, two very good um, day neutral types, the Albion and the Seascape. In considering your location for your strawberries, you're aiming for very good, well-drained soil. That's really what you're after here, is you want them to be able to get water and be able to take up water, uh, but certainly you also want it to be a good drainage and not sit in the wet feet, especially when it comes to planting that first year of a dormant root. You're also aiming for good full sunlight. So looking at between six to eight hours of full sunlight that can help dry out the leaves as well as helpfully address some, um, you know, making sure the plant is getting everything it needs to start producing fruit for you. You also consider rotation away from tomatoes and peppers. If you had a raised bed that the previous year was in tomatoes and peppers, this would not be the same uh, bed that you would wanna grow strawberries in due to disease issues, diseases overwintering. You might also consider avoiding kind of any nearby wooded areas, kind of weedy locations, especially. Strawberries are very poor performers when it comes to um, dealing with any weeds. So avoid weeded areas. And as, as always, kind of those frost pockets where areas might be colder than you fully want it to be. I might also you know, suggest kind of an ease to create exclusions, especially if you have certain areas of your home that you feel like are very <laughs> popular for squirrels and uh, other small animals. Look to see if there's a way to ensure that you could create an enclosure, a netting system, a barrier to keep them from it. And that might be the one decision to, to really make with this. And that would also be why we don't recommend being nearby wooded areas. That's just going to entice smaller uh, mammals to kind of move in and start eating your strawberries. So here you have some spacing for day neutral. So you see here with this drawing here that, you know, the benefit with day neutrals is that you could do double row. So you could go down your row and you could divide that up and stagger your strawberry plants. So you can kind of see that down a single row, it's about 12 inches between from plant to plant, from crown to crown, if you will. And then staggering that next row, it's about 14 inches is what you're after. In this scenario, um, what you do encounter is that you might be able to go closer together. I think what we really see with some of the recommendations for day neutral is an expectation that these are designed for maybe if you had a strawberry business where folks would be coming out and harvesting your strawberries from. Some of these can get closer, I mean, even three inch inches in some containers. I'm a little leery of that. I would say maybe six inches is probably the bare minimum you could do for this. But certainly if you're thinking about a row system 
and you maybe are having people come out and you're thinking that you want to do that, aim for about 14 inches and 12 inch scenario here. One of the things that you know, especially in this drawing, is all runners are removed. So the entire season long, you are removing runners whenever they show up because the runners are taking energy away from that strawberry crown. And you're trying to focus energy on the strawberry crown. Um, this is considered, and of course, this is a long season. You know, as you think about when this season is going to look like, you know, you're planting sometimes the end of April, that first week of May, you're going to be potentially harvesting all the way to mid-October. So really think about your spacing. And you may find, especially this year, kind of play around with it and see, and see what works for you when it comes to spacing of day neutrals. But you're not going to be developing daughters. You're not going to be wanting those runners to be spreading out. They are completely removed every single time they show up. For your June bearing, so now we're talking yet again about this perennial plant that we're going to allow um, to overwinter every year. This is one where we do want runners to be selected. And so you see in this drawing here for June bearing, we've got a row about two feet wide. And then from there, we will have four runners going off kind of in the compass coordinates, if you will, of north, south, east, west. Um, from there, once those four runners have been selected, all runners will continually be removed by hand in most seasons. Um, you really want, especially this year of planting, a greater focus on developing that crown. Between June bearing plants, you could probably go about 18 to 30 inches apart from crown to crown. You might push closer to the 30 inches, just knowing that these runners, the, the runner that you select can, of course, um, produce its own runner, which you really don't want, secondary runners. But the idea, especially with this kind of June bearing, is they will fill it up. You know, these, these plants with the four runners that are selected will start to fill up this area. Between rows, so you should expect about three to four feet from crown in this row to crown in the next row is what your spacing is really going to look like. Yet again, you might lean more heavier on that four feet uh, between rows just to allow for things to spread out much easier. But yes, in this scenario, it's a perennial plant. We want to encourage runners, at least four runners in this season um, and continue to allow those four runners to grow the next season. Um, but all other runners are going to be removed. You compare that, of course, to day neutral, where every single runner is removed as soon as it shows up. Because at this point, with June bearing, it's a perennial plant. So what about containers then? You know, I think that that's where we see a lot of interest in growing strawberries in containers. And I would say, especially if you're just getting started here, you might look for the day neutrals in this situation. And you'll find day neutral plants that would work great in containers. The issue then is if you were growing June bearing, you're gonna to need to overwinter in some way. And you also may find with June bearing that they're a bit more vigorous in um, the productivity of their runners and their daughters, in which case it might be very hard, hard to, to do that in that situation. Um, so you're gonna to have to overwinter in some case. A lot of your guides out there will say about a 10 to 18, 18 inch minimum depth, about 12 inch diameter is what you're after when it comes to container. I think you could probably go a little bit lower than that for your minimum depth. Um, I think probably 12 inch diameter is probably a good place to start uh, when it comes to spacing. What you're gonna encounter when it comes to planting some of these bare rooted strawberries is that they can have some pretty thick roots to them. And it's very important that as much of the roots that you have uh, stay in place and you keep them too. And so that's really why we see that the 10 to 18 inch minimum depth is really what you're after. There are some guides out there and even one of our colleagues um, in Bloomington Normal, uh, she recommends planting day neutrals at about uh, three inches between. So potentially four plants in a 12 inch diameter. Yet again, kind of thinking about those compass coordinates. Of course, in this situation, you know, you're removing all of the runners. So they would probably be okay when it comes to this spacing. You just have to factor in, you know, that maybe playing around and seeing what works. And of course, you know, if you're growing day neutrals, all the runners are going to be removed. 
which can help quite a bit with berry productivity. When it comes to say June berrying in a container, it may be up to you what you decide to do. I think you could probably have runners be produced uh, or in fact actually remove the runners. It's gonna really depend on that since you're considering that you're going to overwinter them. When thinking about that container then, you know, consider spacing out maybe at six to eight inches if it is a container that's going to be overwintered, and if it's going to be those June bearing types that you're going to overwinter. You will find container mixes available to you. Any of those tend to work really well. You'll find them at the Home and Garden Center. They're designed for containers. They're usually designed for fruit and vegetables and, and can work fine for you. If you're going to be using this container and you're going to overwinter this container with June berry and strawberries in it, you still want to add organic matter every year to try to kind of reawaken that soil, if you will. You might also consider adding fertilizer on a weekly basis. Containers are notorious for drainage and drain really well. And that leads to sometimes strawberries having issues with the fertilizer that they need. This is also one where you might look to renovate at the end of the second season. We'll talk about strawberry renovation in say a strawberry patch, but you might be able to adapt renovation to a container. Um, this may be done maybe with clipping, you know, using some clippers or some pruners where you're cutting back some of the leaves from that crown. It's, it's possible to do that, I think. And you see here are kind of this image from Oregon State. You know, these are good solid containers which might be easy to overwinter um, and put in different places uh, depending on where you're growing. You see a lot of fabric bags. Uh, those are kind of newer popular ones that people really like, kind of these fabric felt bags. Uh, this is one, of course, that has a has a tomato in it, and yet it's one that has about a 14 inch diameter is what I measured on it. And so it's one where I could potentially get maybe four strawberry plants in here if I was going to grow them as day neutral. If I'm thinking about June bearing and I'm going to try to overwinter them in this container, I'm probably looking at maybe two plants and maybe really want to focus on about six inches between them if I can. And yet again, would have to maybe play around with the runners that are produced from it. Um, the benefit here is that, you know, potentially it's more breathable. It allows for really good drainage. I think you could also put in a straw mulch around your strawberries to help keep it as weed free as much as you can. I find with these, they're also very easy to move around. The sides of them also roll down as two. The main drawback with them is that they, um, they do tend to have a life hood uh, of about maybe three to four years. You may not find as much success with them because of that, but they're usually very affordable. There's lots of different sizes. Focus highly on the diameter because that will help you determine how many strawberry plants could go in the system. You know, as I look at this one and have measured, I can probably get four day neutral plants in here. If I'm thinking about June bearing, I probably could get two June bearing in here. Uh, with it. What about those other uncommon structures? You see lots of different photos out there where folks have modified some of their growing systems, created these really innovative designs of strawberry pyramids and, you know, one of the ones that you even see here. I would still suggest probably they're going to work best for the day neutral because yet again it's an annual plant you're going to be removing it at the end of the season you're not overwintering it. I think it's also crucial to really think about problems that could arise and one of the ones I already see here with this image is that it's great it's a great water feature and yet the strawberry plant leaf foliage is getting covered in water and that is liable to cause major disease issues on these plants. So think critically about that plant and if it's gonna work well with that structure. Because to me, yes, they could turn off the water and not have the water run out, but I think it's very important to just make sure you're getting strawberries this season and consider what that structure is. We've had folks mention before that they will take gutters and put strawberry plants in gutters. I'm a little concerned with that because there's a lots of um, there's unknowns when it comes to how those gutters have been treated and you could be potentially harming the strawberries. There could be some other issues involved in that. 
And always think about the management tasks that could be hard to accomplish. Factoring in, of course, is it day neutral? Is it June buried? And what are those tasks that you have to do this season? As always, experiment. You know, you're trying out strawberries perhaps for the first time this season. And it's a very forgivable crop because if it doesn't work out this year, you can always start over again the next season with very minimal um, type of you know, fiscal investment here. So day one in the first month, most of the time when it comes to ordering strawberries, you're gonna be ordering them as dormant and bare root. And that's what you see here in this photo from University of Minnesota. Um, they have a really extensive root system. Ideally, we're trying to get as much of that root system into the soil as you can get it. And then from there, the soil is typically gonna cover all the roots up into the crown portion, um, right, kind of right at, the, at, the, at that crown line is what you're after. If you order from many of these nurseries, they will they know what your planting zone is, but you can also request them to send your plants at a certain time. If they do arrive early and you look and see that there's still snow on the ground or it's really, we're expecting snow that season, the next couple of days, you could store them in a cold storage. That's perfectly fine for this group with it. If you purchase them as plants, which you might find at home and garden centers in our locations, um, you wanna look for green non-disease leaves. You also, of course, wanna know, is this ever, is this gonna be June bearing or is this going to be a day neutral? Because that will then dictate what you do that season. Ideally, planting of these should be mid to end of April. You might push it more towards end of April, just as we have seen the last couple of years, some very wet and very cold temperatures. And getting these in the ground earlier, um, you may find that it's much better to wait end of April, first week of May. Um, add compost at planting, you know, make that hole, add them at planting. Yet again, go back to that drawing I showed you. Are they day neutral? Are they June bearing? That's going to determine how far of a spacing you're going to have. And of course, that will also determine how many plants you can place in a certain area. In most cases, fertilizers can be utilized and applied the next couple of weeks after planting. So they're going to be a bit, it's going to be better in most cases to apply the fertilizer, say mid-May in that first year, it kind of wait. Um, and then you may find that you need to apply fertilizer um, more, more frequently. So for June bearing and day neutrals this first season, yet again, day neutrals, we are growing them as an annual plant and then that season's over with. So they're gonna keep, they're gonna produce runners and every time they produce runners, you don't need them, remove the runners. And it's also important too that for that first three weeks of planting, so say we planted our day neutrals the end of April, those first month of May, try to remove all of the flowers the first three weeks. Every time those show up, remove the flowers because they do need a little bit of energy to focus in on that crown, um, really to help have a good long season. But yes, every time that there's a runner that appears, which you see in this drawing here, you're gonna remove it, you're gonna prune it out. When it comes to June bearing then, you're treating this as a perennial. You're fully expecting that this is going to start producing fruit for you in the summer of 2022. And in this, this season of 2021, your focus is on the crown. And what this is gonna be is that, you know, you're gonna locate your four daughter plant runners and you may have to kind of move them around to kind of even and out. And then you're gonna remove all runners throughout that entire growing season. And then you're going to remove all the flowers this entire growing season. And you're not going to get strawberries in the summer of 2021. That's really what you're going to encounter with uh, this June bearing type of strawberry is that the focus this year is going to be on developing that crown and developing that plant so they can successfully overwinter and then start producing more effectively for you in the summer of 2022. So that's really what you're going to encounter here with it. For day neutrals, you know, you've got a method here where first flowers are removed the first three weeks, all runners are removed all season long for June bearing. Every single flower that shows up has to be removed this year. A 
Occasionally, if you're growing day neutrals, one of the recommendations is actually to use some kind of mulch or fabric, fabric mulch or even landscape fabric underneath the plant. The benefit here is that it can help with certainly address weed control. It helps a lot with disease management as well to keep the berries um, cleaner. Uh, but we also find that there's some research that shows it actually can lead to greater yields. And so this is something where that you see in this image here where you've got this black plastic that's, that's utilized. The drawback here though is that in most cases this is utilized under drip irrigation. And we probably are not expecting you to use drip irrigation with the black plastic. I think one of the other drawbacks here is that this is removed at the end of the growing season because yet again, they're day neutrals, they are not going to be grown uh, as a perennial plant. They're grown as that annual. You might be able to keep it in place for a couple of years with some of those heavy duty landscape fabrics. I'm still debating you know, how you might do this, but you might decide that, especially in this year, you have determined that this is the location of where your day neutral strawberries are going to be. You, you have placed the landscape fabric down and then every season you're removing that plant um, so that then you can add, replace that plant in the next year with your day neutrals. I think the main drawback you encounter in that situation is disease pressure can increase because it's strawberries every single year. You might also encounter that the strawberry plants are taking up a lot of those nutrients every single year. And so you may actually have to plant more or apply more fertilizers with it. With it. So that would be the only kind of drawback you might consider in that situation. Um, straw mulch could be utilized, but we see that sometimes it leads to less uh, kind of decline in your strawberries. And one thing to mention, especially with these day neutral groups, is, is during the growing season, you should expect between one to one and a half pounds of strawberry fruit um, from each day neutral plant that you grow. So factor that in and that may help you determine how many how many strawberries you might want to plant. So fertility then with strawberries, you know, especially with a day neutral that's going to require a lot of, of fertility in its only year that it's growing, it can be a bit of a balance. And it really depends on the type that you're growing where you may find that you need to apply more fertilizer. We would recommend, of course, some compost at planting, but recognize that compost is not fully going to give you all the nitrogen that you need that growing season. And you may find that something that has a slow release fertilizer over a season could be very beneficial in this situation, such as Osmocote and, and, and others out there. You might also look towards a balanced fertilizer, some of those 10, 10, 10, 10 of nitrogen, 10 of phosphorus, 10 of potassium, that might be very beneficial here too. If you have now gotten into say July and you just notice there's a lack of runners or kind of vigor, this might be helping you figure out that you need to apply fertilizer. If you're also growing day neutrals and you now are in mid-July and you're not seeing any sort of fruit develop, it's quite possible that you need to apply a fertilizer here too uh, with it. If you're growing say the June berry that are going to be the perennial ones, we typically would, would wait um, you would wait for applying fertilizer in that early summer of the second year. So while you know you plant June bearing in the springtime, you could apply some fertilizers this season in say June and July, you might also decide to kind of stagger it and wait until um, next June. You don't want to do it necessarily in the springtime on June bearing in their second year. That tends to actually make things a little bit worse when it comes to their productivity and makes them a bit more vulnerable for certain things too. Um, if you're growing in containers, they need fertilizers and they need sometimes much more than you realize. This is an image from one of the uh, container growing mixes that I have and I've used before in vegetables. And you see with their, this is the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium um, analysis. There's just not a lot in these container mixes. And so you really need to be applying fertility, sometimes on a biweekly basis for your strawberries if you're going to be growing them.
If you're going to be going June bearing and you're going to, of course, going to be overwintering them, you have to recognize that you're going to need to do a mulching in place. So as soon as they start to get into this dormancy period, this is going to be a necessary practice for overwintering. This is one of the places too where we see lots of issues with because this overwintering of course may not fully mean that the plants survive and produce the next season, but we also find that this is just ripe for disease problems, weed pressure, and just a lot of other issues too, which has been why folks have kind of pushed to move towards the day neutral because none of this would be needed. You would be done with your day neutrals at the end of October, you pull them out, uh, you don't have to worry about overwintering them because you're not going to do that. The plants also need to be dormant during this period if you're going to overwinter June bearing strawberries. And they have what's called a plywood test. So, you know, as you look at the calendar and see that the temperatures are in night temperatures are in the 20s, you could come out, you could place a place a piece of plywood on it, and then the next have that in place for at least two days, remove the plywood. And if the plants are staying green, they have a good green color, then they have entered dormancy. If the plants instead are kind of a yellow brown color, they have not entered dormancy. They were still growing and you need to give it a little bit more time. This is a very simple test that can help you determine if dormancy is ready for the strawberries and if you're ready to apply mulch, uh, especially a straw mulch. Because if you do it too early and the plants are still growing, you're liable to choke out the oxygen from the plants and potentially cause more harm than good. But I would say certainly once the night temperatures start getting into the 20s, that's certainly when you need to apply a straw mulch. I'd say this is gonna be about Halloween for us in most years. We do recommend straw mulch more than the others, about four to six inches. And then this is gonna stay on these strawberry plants until the end of April. And that's when you'll remove them. You could also do leaf mulch. This could work fine for you. It's gonna be better as more of a finely chopped up. So really think more about kind of chopping up those leaves so that it can allow for a little bit more airflow in there. You could probably get away with two to three inches of a leaf mulch in this situation too. If you're growing June bearing strawberries and you're planning to overwinter them in a container, this is one where you may have to do a little bit more experimenting. Um, they really need to be in an area that's 20 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit once they've entered this dormancy period. And you may find that a garage is maybe too cold. I think certainly if you find that your garage is dipping into the teens, that's gonna be a little too cold for, for this group. You may also find that you need to insulate these containers, which is why I think it's very important to consider what structure and what container you have growing your June bearing types of strawberries that you plan to overwinter in it. And of course, some years it may work great and potentially some years it may not work well. For your June bearing, we would also recommend a strawberry patch renovation. So say you have planted June bearing plants in the summer or the rather the spring of 2021, you have selected your runners in that strawberry patch. They now are overwintering in, into next summer of 2022, and then they produce in the summer of 2022. Right after that last picking of June bearing is when you will do a renovation. And the renovation is one that really helps to reinvigorate these plants. It helps with disease pressure, it helps with vigor, it helps with good yields, and it helps quite a bit with maintenance too, because what you will find is that these runners, even though you've only selected four runners, they're still going to spread out and be pretty vigorous with this. And this is one that, you know, if you're thinking about the lifespan of your strawberries, know that this may just be happening for maybe two years. Um, once you've already planted these berries with that lifespan of three to five years. If you're thinking of a container, you could modify it. You could kind of play around with this modification of it. Um, it may be easy to do, or it may be, you know, not worthwhile. We kind of consider there are three actions when it comes to this strawberry bed renovation. Um, there's the mowing, the fertilizer, and the narrowing of the rows. So the mowing action is the one thing that's gonna be helpful here. You're gonna remove most of the leaves um, that to kind of help renew the plants. Um, this is gonna be really good for that plant to really help kind of uh, get it going for the next season to go. Um, 
but you want to get it really close to the crown and there's a fine line here. You want to remove a lot of the growth, but you don't want to cut into the crown because that could lead to disease problems. It may not be able to overwinter either. This could be a mower, this could be a weed eater, this could be hand, but you just want to consider kind of maybe about two inches to start off with from where the top of that crown is. You don't want to really cut into that crown whatsoever. You also will then come through and fertilize after the renovation. And so once you've done this mowing action, come through with a granular fertilizer, spread it on top. That would be a fine uh, action to really help this reinvigoration. You then can narrow that row. And that's where a lot of folks I think see great benefits with this renovation is it helps get the rows back in some shape or helps keep the beds in some shape. And so you see here what I've done with my drawing is that you know we're looking at eight to 10 inch width row and then on either side from there, I'm kind of creating that, that spacing there. So you're gonna find that this is gonna cut a lot of those runners back, but we're keeping that crown in place. When it comes to maybe that next year, so maybe that third year, you should still probably have your daughters in place. I don't think you're gonna have a challenge when it comes to it, but you may find more vigor and you may still find that you need to kind of select them. One of the other things that you might encounter because you have a June bearing type that has straw in the middle of it is that you need to incorporate things too and incorporate the straw between those rows. So eight to 10 inch width rows is what you're after here. And as you can hear with this renovation plan, you could modify it for a container. You know, you could come in and maybe do some hand pruning to maybe help with it, depending on how spread out some of these strawberry plants can grow. Yet again, this action is for June bearing types of berries. If you're doing day neutral strawberries, none of this is required of you. So we'll get into some diseases and insects. You know, they can become a serious problem over time. I think that's certainly what we see is that they tend to just build up in the soil. They can target multiple types of that strawberry plants. One of the other drawbacks though is that there's very few fungicides available for control. So it's very hard to control them. Um, they also tend to be more problematic in a June bearing strawberry. And the reason for this is that you're using a mulch and you're creating a system that really allows for disease to thrive. You compare that to say day neutrals where you are not having to overwinter, where you're not having to deal with a lot of disease and dead debris, where you could really kind of manage things easily. And if disease gets away from you on day neutral strawberries, you can walk away. You can, you can move on, decide, ah, I tried strawberries, I couldn't grow them because I had all this disease pressures. There's many things that can help with managing that though, which we'll talk about, some of these good strategies. Certainly, you know, try disease resistance, perhaps that could help with disease. Always consider planting in full sun, space them correctly to kind of make sure that, um, that you have them and then maybe water early in the day. We always try to make sure that the leaves stay as dry as possible and any kind of wetness is going to increase disease pressure on that. You might also consider a straw or a plastic mulch in place to help keep those berries clean and keep the plants clean as well, which can help lessen disease severity. Patch renovation each year if we've got a June bearing type. You might also consider targeted irrigation right at the crown of it and then managing the straw each season. Consider also the varieties I've shared with you, those hardy types of varieties is really what we recommend because sometimes if say the plant has overwintered, it still may be very vulnerable to some of those uh, very harsh winters we've had and that may open up the susceptibility for diseases. So to show you a couple of these as a black root rot can be common in some seasons, you know, plants can look very stunted in their growth. I think what you would certainly see is that if you pulled up the roots from this plant, um, you, you would encounter it. It could also be just very more susceptible under stress. So if it had uh, a really rough spring or it had winter damage, you may have found that that was what's made it more open here. Yet again, good aeration, good drainage, grow hardy varieties, add compost on a seasonal basis. Anthracnus, we see this a lot with tomatoes. It's different in strawberries, but you can see that it's hitting the fruit, which is very unfortunate. 
You may see this early on some of your leaf blades, kind of the scorched tips or spore mass infection. Sometimes you even see black runners. So from the plant itself, you may see kind of these blackish, brownish runners that occur. It does overwinter on debris from the previous season. So it would be great to try to manage it as much as you could. And then really think about having good airflow. And that may be something to really consider if growing in containers and if growing in June berry, June bearing types of strawberries, is that the airflow may just not be there. And of course, removing infected berries. If this shows up on strawberries, you got to remove it, you got to get rid of it and destroy it. It's not serving you much purpose here. Uh, angular leaf spot, this one we see off and on. It's one where, you know, yes, the leaves kind of are misshapen, they're discolored. We see kind of a bacterial ooze <laughs> from them as well. Consider kind of removal of dead leaves from the previous season. Try to limit watering, very wet foliage. So good practices in place to kind of keep this from being too much of a problem for you. Gray mold, really nasty, just a, a rough looking uh, disease on strawberries. Um, you see it affects the fruit. It will also affect the leaf tissue too. This is one that also is spread by human activity. So it could be that you are actually spreading it yourself, rubbing up against it. Um, even, you know, as you're renovating a, a garden patch, you might even be causing it to, to spread in that or early season too. Just limit working in wet conditions. That is one of the greatest recommendations we have for most of disease is to limit working in wet conditions. And also renovating the beds every single year is good here in full sun. So a lot of those same disease practices, management is what we're after. Powdery mildew is also common on strawberries. This is one where powdery colonies are under the underside of the leaves. Aim for good airflow, proper spacing, but you may find it comes in much later in the season. And you may find too that the strawberries have produced for you, the June bearing types have produced, and you're able to control it. But this is also one where some of these diseases are lasting all season long. And certainly for some of our annual plants, like our uh, day neutrals, you could be dealing with disease all season long. And that's something to kind of consider sometimes. Even though there's a lot of positive things about day neutral, there can be some negative things, of course. So for your insect group, tarnished plant bug, it causes misshapen fruit, which you see here uh, in this photo. Um, the fruit is still edible. It's just not that shape that you're really after here. It's very common in very weedy beds. So try to avoid placement of your strawberry plants in any weedy bed, beds itself. Um, also very common in leaf litter and renovating a patch can help quite a bit uh, for this insect. Yet again, you know, with insects and disease, if we're thinking about day neutral or June bearing types, June bearing is just gonna produce those fruit for a couple of weeks there, comparison to say my day neutrals, that's a long season. And it's a long season of very vulnerable um, berries, perhaps, then. This is our invasive insect, Spotted Drosophila. And you may not realize you have this until it's a little bit too late. And the main problem here is that the adults, which is in the Drosophila, the Drosophila family, are laying eggs and the eggs are hatching into the maggots, which you see here. I hope no one's eating <laughs> strawberries on the call today. Um, this is very common on a lot of small fruits and it's very common on especially strawberries. One of the recommendations we have is to have as the removal of bad berries. So any berries that are overripe, that are gross, remove them and destroy them. You're not gonna compost them. It's the main recommendation for homeowner production here. Um, you could also freeze the berries. Uh, you could also shift to June bearing because then you would just have a concentrated week of, of berries for a couple of weeks. There are some insect traps. They're not always effective when it comes to, to this one too. Um, but certainly day neutral because you're going to be producing berries for weeks and weeks, you're now open to more insect damage from spotted wing drosophila, even though there's great benefits with growing day neutrals. Slugs, these are ones, you know, they're going to feed on lots of different places. I think your main strategy here is going to be some of the beer bait systems where you have a little cap and you have, uh, you know, you place beer in it. 
works really well for slugs in most cases. Um, they do tend to increase in population during the rainy season, especially in the areas that are moist areas with shade, which is where a lot of our June berry and strawberries are. The renovation of your strawberry patch could help keep this from being an issue, but certainly if using straw, if kind of wet areas that aren't drying out, this can make it very vulnerable uh, to, to the slugs um, as they're moving in it. And they tend to go for some of those strawberries. We've talked some about Japanese beetles during our uh, Fruits on Friday series. Yet again, the main recommendation is hand picking, shaking them into a bucket of soapy water because of the small stature of strawberry plants. Excuse me, some folks have had good success with the handheld vacuum and <laughs> from there drown the, uh, the Japanese beetles. You might also be able to get away with floating row cover, although I think one of the drawbacks here is that it keeps the pollinators from getting to, um, to those strawberries that they need to do. Trap crops can also work. Maybe it's marigold or zinnias kind of on the edge of your, of your plants. We usually don't recommend traps because they tend to attract way more than you would ever have. Deer are one to also be on the lookout for. And I think, especially for strawberries, you'll see the damage here where they're just kind of going right at the plants themselves. And especially for an annual plant, it might be very difficult to really manage that. Um, you know, look towards maybe a raised bed, a fencing, a netting might be your best bet for growing strawberries. You know, clean up any debris, kind of hiding areas. There occasionally are some chemical repellents that we've talked about before, but the success rate for them is not always effective. I think especially for young plantings, you might be able to get away with a hot pepper spray applied to the strawberry plants, um, uh, especially early in the season is where they tend to be more to tend to light more. For birds, yet again, probably netting, row cover, very similar to what we've covered previously in fruit production in our fruit series would work well for this group, but they're gonna become pretty tolerant. This is some of the damage which you see here um, with it. So probably a netting or a row cover is gonna be your best strategy here. Yet again, hopefully would keep some of the, the allow for the pollinators to still move in, but a combination and really site selection away from your tree would be would be great here. Now for the ones that just tend to cause trouble, these small mammals, you're going to find that they love strawberries, and if you've never grown them before, they really like them. They don't tend to like vegetables or rather leafy vegetables. The best strategy is a netting. You could do a little bit of a fence, but it needs to be at least 30 inches high. And you need to also make sure that they can't get to those strawberry plants. You might consider small domes or cages of fine mesh, about a half inch opening is what you, what you see here. One of the main suggestions we have for them is removal of bird feeders, which I know can be problematic because a lot of folks really like their bird feeders. But placing bird feeders much further away on your property or, um, or targeting feeding, even feeding this group of small mammals further away from your strawberries and others is really beneficial. And site selection is, is really good here too. A lot of times when I grow tomatoes and other ones, I tend to have it further away from the house knowing full well that this group of small mammals is closer to my house um, and where they live. I also have neighbors that feed the birds and so I try to push them, <laughs> push them that direction instead of my house. So as far as harvest goes, you know, ripe fruit is fully red, you know, really good storage is better if it's about 75% red is what you're after here. You know, you hear a lot of times about, you know, letting things kind of ripen on the vine or ripen on the plant and strawberries really benefit with this. The flavor is just going to be much better if their vine ripened. Know that weather plays a very large role in the flavor of the berries, especially, of course, you know, the cultivar and variety will, but weather can also play an impact here too. If you find that there's any kind of diluted flavor and sweetness, sometimes it's due to rain, Bitterness tends to be more very hot temperatures in the 80s and 90s. And what we really see here is that you may need to harvest early. If you're growing, say, a day neutral strawberry, you may find that the flavor is very different early in your season compared to later in the season, 
much of it potentially due to the weather that ha you maybe have incurred in August um, and into September. So I put together this drawing for you just to kind of look at the two systems, the June bearing and the day neutral. So, you know, in simplistic terms, a June bearing is going to be that perennial strawberry. And when you're growing it, especially in the summer of summer 2021, you're focusing in on that crown and you're focusing in on making sure that that is really developing. You're choosing for runners, you're overwintering the strawberry, and you're not getting harvest in 2021. Once you go into the harvest period and it'll start producing in say summer of 2022, you're looking at about two to three week harvest here at the end of June. Patch renovation is going to be a requirement. Could you grow in container? Question mark here. Really gets back to what you're after. When it comes to day neutral, we've got our annuals. There's no runners whatsoever selected. Every single one is removed. It's not gonna overwinter. The only harvest you're gonna have on day neutral is going to be in 2021. And this is going to be a very long harvest. So fully expect a harvest period here. Yet again, you're only getting about maybe one to one and a half pounds of strawberries for that entire 10 to 12 week harvest from a single plant. There's no patch renovation. It's probably going to work better in container. Of course, you can overwinter day neutrals, but we typically just don't recommend it. So I'm going to wrap up a little bit on kind of our Fruits on Friday series. We'll answer strawberry questions at the end too, along with maybe some other questions you have about fruit production. So to kind of recap, you know, fruits in Northern Illinois, you know, most of these that we talk about will start producing in three to four years. That's really what we're seeing when it comes to them. So if you select them this season, fully expect maturity into year three and four. Of course, tasks leading up to it, the pruning, the management, the control of all of these pieces is really important. In fact, you're in the pain on what that fruit is, it may have more needs compared to others. And I think it's important to control insects and disease, protect from wildlife, and also look at seasonal elements that, you know, sometimes are out of our control. I fully expect right now this winter with what the forecast looks like this next week that we're not going to have a peach crop this season. You know, even if you have a couple of stone fruit, peaches, plums in the backyard, this negative temperatures are fully going to impact that. We should still have our pears and our apples, but we're probably not going to have stone fruit. And that's out of my control at that point. You might also factor in if we have periods of drought, uh, very wet springs, very warm seasons can all impact the, the fruit too. And those trees as they're starting to grow. There's a lot of decisions that can be made to make these easier. Having disease resistance, really thinking about how you trellis and train some of your fruit is really great. It can help you out here. You've heard me talk a lot about reputable nurseries. Here are a number of ones that we um, that folks use and had good have had good success with. Junk seeds out of Wisconsin, Stark Brothers, another good traditional one. Folks buy from Grandpa's Orchard as well, Norse Farms for Small Fruits, Indiana Berry and Plants as well. Those are many online companies, but most of them also have a catalog that you could order and look and kind of decide what fruit you want to grow. Some of the benefits with some of these too is that they're Midwestern focused, but most of them also recognize your planting zone too. Recognize there's also many local options. I don't want to, um, you know, just say that, you know, go with the ones listed here. There's many local options available to you. I think some of the challenges might be that you're just not going to find what you need uh, when it comes to some of them. Note again, we do not endorse a particular company over another. These are just mentioned as examples of very common nurseries and companies you could order from here. Uh, I have ordered some from, from some of these companies. I know other folks on the call have ordered from some of these companies too. So you saw this screen a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to kind of modify it a little bit and kind of just talk about reliability and so forth. Most reliable, you're gonna find good success for plums, sour cherries, apples, pears, grapes, strawberries. These are gonna be the most reliable when it comes to yielding for you every season. Of course, you have to factor in certain features, but in most cases, these should be very reliable if you've kind of done everything you're supposed to. As far as consistent and as far as an annual fruit, you've heard today day neutral strawberries. That would be the one if you want immediate satisfaction with your growing of fruits in Northern Illinois. 
Fully expect every other year or so, peaches, apricots, and nectarines. That group is just very inconsistent, especially when it comes to very cold temperatures we encounter every winter. And of course, the least reliable is sweet cherries due to that you need more than one cultivar and that they're also very vulnerable to these very cold winter conditions that we're soon to encounter the next couple of weeks. That's what I would imagine so. So when folks come to our extension office and we talk about our fruit, this is kind of that most reliable group and then from there. So you can see you've got quite a lot of options in fact. In thinking more about your cultivars, you know, there's going to be some that need more than one, or we encourage you to have more than one, such as apples, pears, plums, sweet cherries, apples, certainly you need more than one cultivar flowering at the same time. Some of the other ones just will yield more for you if you have more than one cultivar. We always recommend disease resistance for apples, pears, and grapes. And this is just a great practice to do. And I certainly encourage disease resistance for pears at this point. Fire blight, which you see in this photo, is highly destructive and people are losing pear trees every single year because of fire blight. So have disease resistance for, for pears is what you're after here. We also, of course, will recommend this time dwarf, semi-dwarf trees more than the standard fruit trees, which you'll see a lot of. So lean heavier on those for for just their, um, their yields and success with them. Other things we've shared in our series, you have very few options of stone fruit, strawberries, and uncommon fruit for Northern Illinois. We have to factor in that, you know, when it comes to peaches that you might wanna grow, it's going to be Madison, Reliance, and Contender. So you have three peach options for yourself. Even the same with strawberries, you'll, you'll find limited varieties sometimes of those too. You know, we compare that to some of the others. Uh, same with uncommon fruit. We've talked about pawpaws. We've talked about some of those other fruits out there and you're gonna find very limited options um, that would grow well for us. On the opposite side, you've got a wide range of options for grapes and apples. Grapes, you may find close to 70, 75 types that would grow great in our planting zone and consistently grow really well for us. Apples, uh, where to get started on apples? You have sometimes hundreds of apples. And yet again, it's back to that rootstock and it's winter hardiness. I always encourage folks to really think about your long-term goals. I think especially if you're thinking that this is going to be a project that becomes a hobby and maybe becomes a side business, you really wanna think about the cultivars you're choosing, especially for great production and potentially especially for apple production too. Um, if you're thinking about having a little you pick strawberry operation, you want to think about what varieties might work really well if you're going to have folks come out and pick strawberries. And focus, focus, focus on winter hardiness. Ensure that you have winter hardiness for our growing area and choosing varieties that can withstand very cold temperatures every single year. Um, doesn't always need to be said, but think about spacing your plants correctly. This is going to allow for that good airflow. It's going to allow for good yields. It's going to reduce any competition that might have happen. I've shared with you before, you know, the rule of thumb when it comes to spacing a dwarf or semi-dwarf trees based on its expected height. So if you think about what area you have, if the tree is going to get 14 to 16 feet tall, like a semi-dwarf, you would space it from trunk to trunk at about 14 to 16 feet. For cross-pollination purposes that some of these trees need, it needs to be a 50-foot distance, kind of a 50-foot diameter, if you will, from that tree is what you're going to have to factor in. And knowing full well that apples need cross-pollination, you need to know that and be aware of that. For grapes, six to eight feet between plants. For containers, it may depend highly on that diameter and may depend on kind of how you expect to overwinter it and move it around even. It's important with this group to just plan for insects, diseases, and wildlife. And you may find that you get hit hard every single season with disease, every single season with insect, every single season with, with wildlife. We've covered many different practices that we might recommend when it comes to helping to address these. A lot of times it's location, being aware of any place where certain things could occur or couldn't allow for maybe good airflow. You also will do good pruning practices, which will also help to lessen disease pressure and lessen wildlife damage and insect pressure. 
there are a number of traps available when it comes to controlling apple maggot um, and some of our other diseases or rather insects that impact this group. And then for wildlife, lean heavier on the barriers and deterrence. So anything that maybe is going to repel them from getting to those, these very young plants. Of course, disease resistant cultivars is one of the things to consider here too, that can help quite a bit with our fruit trees. Know what you're getting yourself into when it comes to fruit trees and when it comes to grape production. You are going to need to prune. You're going to need to do pruning on a yearly basis to get the tree that you see here on the left, as well as the grape drawing that you see here on the right to produce and to grow really well for you. These are some actions that will hopefully get the fruit that you need, but also ensure that these plants really have a long lifehood knowing full well that both of them can really live, live up into that 30, 35 years worth of age. And it's something to very much be considerate if you're thinking of planting these in your growing area. So what is your commitment to pruning that? I don't want you to email me photos of your uh, rough looking trees in a couple of years uh, that haven't been pruned. I want you to start off strong and I want you to get them in the shape that they need to be in order to yield for you. Of course, if you email me years from now, I will, I will help you out, but know what you're getting yourself into with these groups. They're gonna to need to be pruned. So as we get wrapped up with our series, um, enjoy your fruits this season and gosh, enjoy them for years to come. I think that that's one of the great benefits with fruit in Northern Illinois and in uh, the Midwest in general is that when they yield for you, they yield really well for you. And I think that it's important to have good practices in place, consider what your, you know, your long-term goals are here with this. So I think it is a great time right now, I mean, especially as we see uh, pretty negative cold temperatures the next week and the next couple of weeks to really think about your options, your goals and your commitment. And that's what I've really tried to do with this series is to help you figure out what's gonna work well for you, but also rule out what you don't wanna do. And I hope that that's something that really helps you when it comes to what commitment you might be willing to do when it comes to growing them or seeing them succeed. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that just as we saw last year, we're fully expecting a lot of places to sell out on our fruits as well as our vegetables this season. So this is a really good time to go ahead and don't wait to order because many of these places will start to run out of them. And especially if you're gonna put some of what we talked about in action and grow them, would certainly encourage you to do that. Um, I can share with you, I'm growing a lot of, I'm growing two different day neutral strawberries this season. I've got Albion and I have Seascape. I just put in an order for them a couple of days ago. So I've got about 75 plants of them coming this spring. Uh, my family has found the section for grapes. And so we're going to determine where, what type of grapes we want to grow this season. Uh, probably about two to three, I think is what we're going to grow. And we're still trying to determine what we're going to do there. Um, certainly you've seen photos of my peach trees, not expecting peach trees this season. Uh, you see a photo of our peach tree at the Rockford office. I don't think we're going to get peaches at the Rockford office as well. So you will get uh, an email with resources. Uh, if you've also gone through our entire series, you also get a link to an evaluation, which just kind of helps us when it comes to um, our, our classes and webinars we're planning to do this upcoming season as well with it too. Um, so we've got some time. I'm gonna go ahead and look at the questions that have come through in our chat box today. All right, so one of the questions was, um, you know, purchasing Albion roots um, and see this prefer, referred as a kind of an ever bearing rather than a day neutral. Um, if it's Albion, is that fine? Or should we be sure it's identified specifically as a day neutral? Um, I, would, I would check to make sure that that is specifically a day neutral because you certainly run the risk uh, that it could be an everbearing. And while it would grow for you fine, you know, that whole everbearing distinction is then stating that you're going to plan to overwinter it and you'll have a shorter season period with that. So I would check before you order them just to make sure it's day neutral with it. I don't really see the day neutral or the ever bearing terms kind of go back and forth. There's, they really are two very different systems there. 
Uh, there was a question. I have wild strawberries that have literally taken over my yard. They have yellow flowers and thought it was medic, but they have red berries. Looked it up and they are the Canadian wild strawberries. Have a bland taste. Will these cross with my domestic ones? Um, I, I don't think they will cross with them. Uh, I think they're going to probably stay within their same group with it. They might, but I, I just don't see that really happening with with them. Um, you could also, of course, you know, decide if you're going to, you could manage them a bit too, I would say, uh, if you so chose. But I, I don't think we're going to see much of them kind of crossing over. Uh, question, can you recommend a reputable online source for purchasing bare root June berry plants? Yeah, so the ones you saw listed on the last page um, would be good places to start. Uh, Jung's has them. Um, the Norse group has June bearing strawberries. And then, I and then the Indiana fruit group has strawberries as well uh, with it. And each of them have different prices. Most of them are in increments of 25 each. So that's just one thing to kind of consider with them is those increments are usually 25. Um, question, do you have experience with Burgess Seed and Plant Company in Bloomington and Mount Ura Canar Street? I've not, I've, I've heard of them before. I've never ordered them from from my, for myself, um, so they may work for you. I'm just not, not too sure about that. Uh, Follow-up question, any plans for a program on raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries? We are beginning to plan uh, for springtime. So we'll certainly put that on the list of kind of topics to cover is kind of that group of, of canes as well as blueberries uh, with it. So thanks for the suggestion. We'll put that on there. Uh, question, I think Owens Nursery Burgers and Keller are the same company. Burgess is the mail order side. Owens is the retail brick and mortar side. They have different dresses, but pretty sure they're the same company and, and next to each other. All right. So a note from Steve in the chat box about the, that company. Question, uh, we planted strawberries last year, but did not remove any of the runners. Should we do any removal of the runners or daughters this year? I would, yeah. So Jamie, I would go and try to find you know, where that crown is. And then from there, see if you could select those four daughters. And then from there, I would say this spring, remove everything else so that they could just, so that, that plant could just focus on those four, um, four daughters in that situation. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, an, an additional step you would have to take this spring to kind of get them back. All right, any additional questions in the chat box?